Welcome to Book Talk. Once upon a time, Parliament and the courts were careful not to tread on each other's toes. The theory was that MPs and peers broadly made the laws and the judges broadly interpreted them. But it was never quite that simple. And in recent years, and even more in recent months, it's become a lot more complicated. As detailed in Trials of the State, the new book by my guest today, the former Supreme Court Justice Jonathan Sumption. And the basic problem, uh, Jonathan, is that you explore in this is that that frontier is now in flux and that has huge implications for democracy. The frontier has never been entirely clear but it's always been possible and it still is to see some decisions that are plainly on the wrong side of it. Our system depends on a difference between the judicial function and the legislative and political function uh, and it's necessary in a democracy because judges are not answerable to the electorate, either directly or indirectly, whereas politicians and legislators are and ought to be. But judges have, from time to time in the past, filled in the gaps or interpreted the law where circumstances perhaps not originally envisaged when a law was written come, come before the courts, and that's always been a part, uh, certainly, of the higher court's work. Yes. Um, the common law is a system of customary law and it is almost entirely made by judges and judges develop it in accordance with in, rep in response to changes in our society um, and needs which were not always anticipated that's perfectly okay on the other hand there are uh, in the past the common law has been developed uh, on very careful lines and within an existing framework of principle uh, and on a basis which respects the distinct and overriding functions of Parliament. But now we've got a, a bit of a game changer in the shape of the Human Rights Act, which put the European Convention on Human Rights into UK law, and in effect it seems to me gave the courts the power to declare that the law was invalid, almost to strike down legislation from Parliament if it was inconsistent with the Human Rights Charter. They don't have the power to strike down legislation. They do have the power to strike down um, ministerial orders based on legislation uh, and they have power uh, to um, uh, declare that um, some act, piece of parliamentary legislation is contrary to the Human Rights Convention. There is a rather indistinct understanding that Parliament will then amend the, um, the legislation accordingly. And in fact, it has almost invariably done so. The one notable exception concerns prisoners' votes. Yes, the prisoners' votes one has been batting around for quite a while here. Yes. But that, that was, a, again, a human rights case where the ruling was fairly clear that there ought to be some level of access to the vote for prisoners, yes. but it was for Parliament to decide what. And Parliament never has. Parliament's well, just not gone there. Uh, Parliament has gone there. Parliament has decided that the current, um, uh, uh, current rules regarding prisoners are fine. I mean, there's a degree of irrationality about the way that the Strasbourg court approached the question of prisoners' votes uh, because um, essentially what our law says is that if a crime is serious enough to warrant imprisonment at all, it's serious enough to warrant not being allowed to vote. Um, the Strasbourg court has said, well, um, you've got to have some kind of test for whether it's serious enough. Well, we do. It seems to be the problem, the problem that the Strasbourg Court seems to have with our law is that you can have uh, any test you like to decide whether a case is serious enough to warrant deprivation of voting rights, except a test which coincides with the test for imprisonment. And we never had any explanation from them as to why that should be so. But the real point about prisoners' votes is this was an absolutely direct example of a clash between uh, democracy uh, as expressed by the wishes of Parliament in a statute and subsequently in debates in the course of which it was decided not to change the law uh, and a legal view uh, which regarded that outcome as unsatisfactory. Now, in a democracy, how are you to resolve differences of opinion of this kind on which two reasonable views can be held uh, without an essentially political process to resolve it. The problem about resolving it judicially is that it takes the decision out of the hands uh, of uh, legislators responsible to the public at large and therefore out of the hands of the public at large and confers it upon 
uh, a body of people who may be enlightened and who may be intelligent, but who are not answerable to the people. And that seems to me to be uh, completely inconsistent with basic democratic principle. And where does that lead us? I mean, another case that uh, you, you dwell on in the, in the book is the case of Prince Charles's so-called yes. spider letters, the letters to ministers that uh, people wanted released un under um, freedom of information legislation. Ministers tried to certify that it was not in the public interest to do so, and they were overridden in the Supreme Court. Yes. Well, um, the problem that, about that was that the Act of Parliament, I think, was perfectly clear. Uh, it, what it provided was that the, that the Attorney General uh, should be an, entitled uh, to issue a certificate which would have the effect uh, of treating the relevant decision as a matter in the public interest. In effect, it said that um, it, in certain circumstances, ministers could uh, reach a political decision for which they would be answerable to Parliament uh, instead of the courts deciding it on a legal basis. Now, I can see absolutely no reason why, on an issue like that, uh, it should not be resolved. Well, the, the, sorry, in an issue like that, why the public interest should not be determined by ministers responsible to Parliament as opposed to the courts. The courts do not have a monopoly of political wisdom. Uh, they are not the only people qualified to judge what is in the public interest and if Parliament has enacted that a minister can determine conclusively uh, that it is not in the public interest uh, for the Prince of Wales's letters to be disclosed, then I can see absolutely no principled objection to that. Whether the Prince of Wales's letters should be disclosed is a matter of supreme unimportance. Uh, but the question how you decide that is very important indeed. And those decisions uh, are as between, on the one side, um, judges who've come up through the judicial ranks, as it were, and on the other side, elected politicians. And neither, uh, possibly uh, judges are held in, in higher esteem these days than elected politicians. But you have a large chapter in here in defense of politics, mm. where you warn your judicial ex-colleagues not to overreach. The advantage of politics is that it provides a method of accommodating dissent, of accommodating differences of interest and opinion among the population at large. Uh, judicial decisions don't do that. Judicial decisions are a zero-sum game. Uh, one party wins, the other pays the price. Uh, essentially, parliamentary politics are an institutionalized method of arriving at a solution which it may be nobody would have adopted as their preferred choice, uh, but which everybody can live with. We are at the moment going through a major political crisis uh, in which um, clearly the priority ought to have been from the outset to arrive at a solution that the widest possible range of the population can live with. Politics can't always achieve that, and it hasn't achieved it recently in relation to Brexit, but there are very many issues on which it can and does, and it is much more satisfactory in a democracy uh, for issues to be hammered out in that way than for them to be decided by judges and handed down like tablets from the mountain. And the judges have been handing down a few tablets from the mountain on the Brexit issue, haven't they? Yes. And both of those were extraordinarily political and attracted an awful lot of opprobrium on the judges' heads. Well, they were political in their consequences. They were not political in their reasoning. I was party to Miller No. 1, and I wholly applaud Miller No. 2. And the reason for this is that both the Miller decisions were concerned with preserving the power of Parliament, and particularly preserving the power of Parliament uh, over the executive. There is a world of difference between the courts uh, taking a power and exercising it themselves, and the courts saying, no, this is a matter uh, for Parliament. And that is what the courts have done in both the Miller decisions. Uh, I believe that uh, in our kind of democracy, uh, parliamentary decision-making is absolutely fundamental. I wholly applaud any judicial decision which preserves the power of Parliament uh, to hold the executive to account and to legislate, if necessary, over the, over the executive's dead body. I do not applaud uh, decisions which essentially arrogate parliamentary or ministerial powers to the courts themselves.
And do you detect that the courts are becoming prone to do that, to go a little bit further than they should? Is, is there overreach here? Well, there is overreach, but I think you have to bear in mind that quite a lot of the overreach is in fact uh, justified legally by, in particular, the Human Rights Act. There are other issues as well, but that is obviously one major uh, 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 license for judicial decision-making on political issues. And th the courts are essentially applying the law. The question is whether we are sensible to have a law uh, which vests that kind of power uh, in judges. The problem is not so much in the Human Rights Convention uh, itself. It's not so much in the nature of the rights that are protected. It's the exceptions from the rights. Because virtually all convention rights are subject to exceptions for cases where, for example, uh, public health, the suppression of crime uh, and other recognized public interests are thought to prevail uh, over the relevant right. Now, uh, that is a very p intensely political issue. Take privacy, for example. Article 8 of the Human Rights Convention protects the right to privacy. But the real arguments that come before the courts about Article 8 are not about whether there exists a right of privacy, but whether there is a justification for departing from it. Now, if you are going to decide whether um, uh, it is right to override the right of privacy in the interests, for example, of catching more criminals, that is a matter on which reasonable people can differ. It's a classic political issue. It's a conflict between two incommensurate considerations. It's the classic stuff of political and legislative processes. It's not a matter which is properly before uh, the courts. Uh, of course, it's properly before them now in the sense that the Human Rights Act requires them to consider it. But I think that this is a serious mistake. And, and there's a very downbeat and, and rather alarming section towards the end of, of this book where you wonder if what we're seeing is a process where democracy is being devalued, hollowed out, eroded from within, not with a bang, not with tanks on the street as you put it, but just a general hollowing out. I think that that is a serious danger. Uh, I think that judicial decision making is by no means the only uh, potential source of the problem, but I think that anything uh, which removes major social issues on which people have perfectly legitimate feelings and prevents them from deciding through the, battle, ba the ballot box uh, how those issues uh, should be resolved uh, is clearly inconsistent with the democratic constitution. There are a handful of rights which ought to be beyond um, majority decision. Uh, but very, they are few in number, and the decision when to depart from them is a very delicate decision that is almost invariably political. And if Parliament isn't the institution taking those decisions, the argument goes, why should the voters, why should the public in general take Parliament seriously? Well, it's not just that. If Parliament isn't uh, deciding it, then who is and in what sense uh, can they uh, be said to be responsible for these decisions to the public at large? My view is that the public at large is entitled uh, to the ultimate right uh, to choose legislators who will make these decisions uh, and to take that right away from them and uh, give them to a body of people, however enlightened, and they are very enlightened, judges are wholly admirable people, but to take the decision away from those who are responsible to the people who elected them and, giving, and give it to judges strikes me uh, as being a, a, a serious mistake. It may well be uh, that judges make very good law. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. The record is rather patchy. Um, uh, but the question, what is good law and what is bad law, is a matter of opinion. And does if the same argument apply also to having had a referendum on a subject, I mean no particular Brexits, uh, having had a referendum on that subject, Parliament then being uh, appearing not to honour that referendum. Is, is that part of the same process? Well, uh, I uh, have said in the book, that, and I strongly believe, that a referendum is uh, a, an absolutely deplorable constitutional device, because a referendum is a technique for circumventing the political process. And since the political process is designed to accommodate our differences, uh, and a referendum doesn't do that, this is a very unfortunate state of affairs. Uh, we have had now three and a half years uh, in which the Brexit issue 
has torn families apart, threatens to divide the integrity of the United Kingdom, has produced ugly threats of violence in and out of Parliament. Uh, that is what happens uh, when you have a technique of decision making which abandons the whole process of compromise and accommodation, uh, which is the essence of the parliamentary process. Well, it's a fascinating exploration of the constitutional dilemmas the country now faces. Lord Sumption, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Trials of the State, Law and the Decline of Politics is published by Profile Books. The Book Talk will be back again soon, so do join us then.